Sounds good. We should ask them if they realize All right. the uh, cosplay thing. I'm going to get started in a few <laughs> seconds. Thank you, everyone, for being here. You know, it's like close to the end of the day, first day. Everybody having a good PAX so far? Mm. Yeah, I love it. I love that. I'm so glad that, you know, everybody's here having fun, talking about video games, video you games. know? My favorite thing. I don't know about y'all. I hate is, video games. You, what? Well, thank you everyone for being here and welcome to the history of 90s PC gaming. My name is Ash Said Hi and I'm going to be your moderator for today. I'm going to be asking my wonderful panel some very interesting and intriguing questions so we can learn a little bit about the background and all of the things that they've done in their careers. So if you want to go ahead and start introducing yourselves, that's me. Hi. Hi. Ash said hi. I also stream on Twitch. That's that's pretty much what I do now. Um, but yeah, let's start introducing Dave. Uh, hey, I'm Dave. I run uh, New Blood Interactive. We are an uh, indie studio that makes games like uh, Dusk, Medieval, Ultra Kill, Faith, Fallen Aces, and Gloomwood. And that's why I am Dressed like this today, I don't normally dress like a 1940s goon. Uh, we are promoting Fallen Aces down on the floor. Go fucking play it. <laughs> Thank you, I love that. Also, Dusk is really amazing. Thank you. I love that game. Thank you. Scott's a big fan. <laughs> Scott. Oh, me? Yeah. Um, I founded uh, Apogee um, and 3D Realms in the 90s. And uh, we kind of kicked off, really, I guess, um, in some ways, the whole indie gaming movement because um, until we came up with this whole idea of releasing games online and having people send us checks in the mail. Uh, you had to really work <laughs> with, a, with a retail publisher. And um, so yeah, we just got our start. We released games, we started working with the software, did you know, Commander Keen, Wolfstein 3D. We did some of our own games like Rise of the Tried, Duke 3D, Shadow Warrior. We worked with other companies to make games like Prey and Max Payne 1 and 2. So yeah, we've just been doing our thing and uh, got a booth here at PAX. Combine, check us out. Nice. I, you know, I just played Commander Keen for the first time ever in December. It was very fun. Yeah, cute game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jen? Look at that Hi. headshot. Wow, <laughs> fancy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Jaron Moore. Um, I'm executive producer for Apogee Entertainment. Uh, uh, here with this guy. Um, Scott and I go way back. I'm an original uh, 3D Realms employee. I uh, worked on Prey. Uh, spent a little time on Duke Nukem Forever uh, before I popped over to Gearbox. Um, uh, did some external producing for Nintendo, uh, producing events, uh, The Legend of Zelda Symphony of the Goddesses, uh, 25th Anniversary Symphony, and Pokemon Symphonic Evolutions. Um, eventually wrapped back around and uh, producing games uh, and uh, helping this guy lead development uh, for our developers over at Apogee. Nice, awesome. I think I still have my Zelda Symphony poster at home. <laughs> yeah, David? I was hoping that was the picture you found on the internet. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Uh, my name's David Lowy and I'm Atari. Um, also the new home of Digital Eclipse and Night Dive, which is pretty exciting. Um, but, you know, we've been around 50 years. Uh, the 90s is definitely one of our eras. The 90s is definitely one of my eras. Um, I'm in the Marcoms role, but uh, I've played a number of different roles at Atari, including spending some time in uh, distribution and publishing. Uh, a lot of that was spent uh, working with our PC titles from the 90s, so fun topic. Awesome. Well, thank you for those introductions. You all have had incredible careers. So. Let's get into some really fun questions. Um, first, could you share your favorite game from the 90s? Why does it stand out to you? Uh, my favorite game from the 90s? I'm gonna say Rise of the Triad. Yeah, because we got an advertising, <coughs> ludicrous edition available now on Steam and GOG and PS4 and Xbox. And, uh, well, I, this, the reason I work with Rise of the Triad now is the same reason I loved it in the 90s, because it was different than everything else. Back then, we had things called Doom clones, because there was Doom, and then everything like Doom was just called a Doom clone. But there was one that was funny and silly and had a sense of humor 
and it had, uh, it had a magical baseball bat, and you could turn into a dog, and you could literally turn into God on the first level, and it wasn't even a secret. It was like the critical path. You just like, and it's, it was crazy, and it was nothing else like it, and you could play as five different characters. No game had done that. You could play as women. No game had done that yet in a first-person shooter. It was like, it was like nothing else, and I was like, this is, and nobody else knew about it. None of my friends, I was, they were still playing like Doom and Quake and stuff, and like, somehow I got rot. You know, and the kids that got rot were like, we were a little weird. Um, <laughs> And it's and it stuck with me, um, and it stuck with me for 30 years. And now I, you know, I get to work on the remaster, and we're coming up on the 30th anniversary, um, you know, in February. And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna, you know, forever and always say Rise of the Triad, you know. And I got to obviously I've been able to, you know, work with the guys that worked on the original, which is crazy because, you know, I'm a little bit younger than them, even though I'm turning 40 this year. Kill me, um, <laughs> and which means Scott's turning like 80. Um, <laughs> And it was, um, yeah, so I'm always going to say Rock because it's a really special place in my heart, you know, and getting me able to work with these guys and then guys like Tom Hall, uh, the legend. Uh, it's, been, it's been really fun. So, yeah, I'm going to say Rock. I love it. Me? Yeah, me, sure. Me, me. Go into the you, can go, you can go down the line or whoever's no, 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 inspired no, no, no. To, to answer. Uh, you know, it's funny. I didn't really discover the first-person shooter until the 2000s. That's what, that was my, my FPS era. So for me, the 90s were more uh, the games where they were trying to figure out um, where the line was be between uh, hardcore sim and, and, and fun sim. Mm -hmm. You know, so there were a lot of really good, um, you know, military sim titles that played that line. And then, of course, um, uh, the OG Park Simulator Roller Coaster Tycoon. So I'm going to oh, throw that so one down. so good. So good. Theme park, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What's up? Uh, so 90s gaming, um, I was born in 81, and so uh, uh, I was a late, a mid to late 80s gamer as a kid, and uh, for me, 90s gaming kind of represents uh, uh, the foundations of what I became familiar with in video games, which was like Atari and Nintendo, um, kind of growing up, and like, for me, like The Legend of Zelda, for instance, um, uh, the 86 version. Um, Link to the Past came out, and that felt like the grown-up version of what Nintendo was like really shooting for. Um, and, uh, and of course, then after that was, was, uh, was Ocarina of Time. But um, uh, yeah, 90s gaming for me is just a m more mature, like advanced, um, sort of pass at sort of like the things it was trying to do uh, 10 years earlier. Um, and uh, it's very definitive for me. Like I was playing like Ultima, which was like a predecessor of uh, Elder Scrolls. I was playing Wing Commander, uh, loved that series. Um, uh, this guy was tossing me floppy disks of like Wolf 3D uh, before it came out. That was my first first person shooter. Uh, my mom was like, what the hell are you playing? <laughs> <laughs> Who's letting you shoot Nazis in my house? <laughs> Why is Hitler running around in a robot suit? Um, uh, Rise of the Triad, yeah, very, very, very much a definitive moment. Um, uh, and Duke 3D was probably like the quintessential like FPS for me. Uh, more, than, more than Rise of the Triad. R Rot was great. Build Engine was like kind of, I feel like kind of started to change the landscape. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's my answer. Yeah, I think one of the reasons we're all here is because the 90s have, there's a lot of memories from that era. You know, it's, it was such an experimental decade, so many new things coming out that we hadn't seen before. For me, you know, uh, Diablo was, was monumental, um, and uh, I'd have to throw in, it was, Half-Life was 90s also? 97, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, these were, I mean, there's, I, I can just gonna list, you know, I mean, the Ultimate Games, there's so many games that were so mind-blowing to me uh, and, and opened up my eyes to what was possible in gaming. Uh, even though I was in the game industry, you know, I could still have my mind blown. And so, I mean, those games were, were definitely among the, the best ones I can remember. Games were literally better then. <laughs> the, the 90s were better. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, that makes me think, like, do you think that we've lost something in the charm of like the way games are made. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, Ash, we were experiencing it all for the first time. These were new ideas yeah. then. And now we're just iterating on 
uh, iterations. Yeah. Like games as a service in the 90s. There was no microtransactions. I mean, there were. Well, Scott was, yeah, selling, you know, pieces of a game and then making you send $60 in to get the rest of the game. That was smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, did, did you do that? What? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And the shareware episodes were always better than the registered game. You son of a bitch. <laughs> That's true. Well, I think for me, you know, like just like you, Jaren, I grew up playing like consoles mostly. I didn't have a computer that like I could play things on. But if I could really think back to games from the 90s, I would say like Day of the Tentacle and definitely Diablo is yeah. for me. Yeah. Day of the yeah. Tentacle. Like, oh, Lucas Arts all the way. I mean, yeah, yeah like great. all those point and click adventure games, King's all that kind of stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, Diablo changed everything. I mean, I know a lot of developers at the time after Diablo came out, they're like, oh, we need to. We can't make turn-based games anymore. We need to start making action. We need to do this, and it's slow. It was one of those games that, like, if you worked anywhere in the '90s, it slowed down development because everyone was playing Diablo. Like, <laughs> not, it's I mean, who doesn't want to be a loot goblin? Yeah, like, it was, seriously. Yeah, it changed. It, it really changed everything. Yeah. Well, you know, um, let's get into a deep dive question. So, Dave, I got a question for you. Should've Considering <laughs> New Blood's emphasis on retro-inspired titles. What elements from 90s PC gaming do you find most crucial to bring into today's game? All of them. <laughs> um, you know, so a lot of what we do is obviously, you know, we're in, you could say we're in the spiritual successor business, and business is good. Um, and a lot of that is because we are now old enough to make games like the games that we grew up with, and not just copying them, but taking the best bits of them. So, you know, the best bits of the things we like from whether it be shooters or whether it be uh, games like Resident Evil or whether it be games like Devil May Cry or whether it be games like Quake and Doom. Um, it all kind of works if you use the best bits of that. Um, so I'd say the things that are, you know, from the 90s especially that are important. The blueprint, were all, it's, the blueprints have been there to make good games. Uh, things like level design, um, things like having, you know, uh, you know, contrasts in the way you present things to the players. Um, all these things that, you know, John Romero outlined, you know, 20, 30 years ago are still literally the blueprints for making a good first person shooter. Um, so we take all of that stuff, um, and yeah, I think less hand-holding for one is absolutely is something, um, we never, uh, as a law at New Blood, never take player agency away, not yeah. once. I won't take the camera away from you to show you something. If you don't see it, then we didn't do our good enough job showing it to you. Um, and that's fine. Players are allowed to miss things in our games. It's fine. You can replay them and maybe you'll see it a second time or maybe yeah. you'll see it on YouTube. Um, yeah. but you know, in, in the nineties, we didn't do that we, I was, I was, you know, 14, we, they didn't do that stuff. I read a lot of books about it though. Um, I was there you know, uh, as a kid. But um, yeah, so we try to take the, the best of, is what I would say. We take the best of those games and the stuff that we like the most about those games and we apply those lessons to our games. And I think that's what makes our games not only good, but uh, resonate with a lot of people like me who grew up in the 90s. Yeah. I can definitely say, like, I miss things like instruction manuals and, like, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Hit books, because, you know, all the pirates in the 90s, uh, what was it they always used to say at Sierra? They sold more Leisure Suit Larry hint books than they sold games. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone was pirating it because they didn't want to get caught by in the sleazy game. <laughs> oh. But they couldn't figure out the puzzle, so they had to buy the hint books. Yeah, it's true. So, okay, Scott, I've got a question for you. Um, Apogee and 3D Realms pioneered shareware in the 90s, right? So revolutionizing game distribution. How did this model come about, and how do you view its impact on the industry today? Uh, it came about because I was writing, writing games back in, uh, I guess, the late 80s and uh, sending them off to publishers and, and getting nothing but rejection letters. Mm. So uh, this new thing, I mean, you know, the, the internet was kind of like, you know, still not around, but there was BBS systems and everything. So, I, and, and there was things like CompuServe and Genie and AOL and Prodigy was getting its start. So, Next I was like, yeah. I'm just going to release this and, and see if people will send me money. And yeah. it, it, <laughs> it worked. It seemed to have worked, yeah. But other, other people had tried to do this, but they hadn't had the idea of, let's hold back part of the game. <laughs> and that's what the reason they're sending in money for. So, that's kind of the, the little breakthrough I had. Um, was, was the part of, you know, send me money and I'll send you the rest of the game, <laughs> uh, the, you know, the other episodes. <clears throat> so that was kind of, that was kind of like the big innovation and um, what was the rest? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Adam. Um, how do you view its impact on the industry today? Uh, I mean, nowadays it's not a thing. You know, Steam came along and really changed everything and made things probably better for distribution by a long shot. But, um, you know, um, it, what, it, what it did back in the 90s was it allowed companies like us and id Software and Epic and, and many others to kind of like get their start without having to worry about going through a publisher. Yeah. And, you know, and having the publisher own your IP and basically, you know, it, it just allowed us to be fully independent studios, make exactly the games we wanted to make. You know, like for instance, when we, we did have a publisher we worked with uh, for Form, uh, called FormGen for who wanted to release Wolfenstein. And uh, they were seeing early builds of the game and they were like, you know, Scott, you know, you, you should tell id Software that this game's a little too violent. We, we, we shouldn't be really killing dogs, for instance. And, uh, and, and, they were, and, and the guy at FormGen was like, you know, can, can you pass this on to, to id Software? And I said, sure, sure, sure. And I never did. Because, because, because I loved it. I loved, you know, everything that it was doing. I wasn't going to tell them to tone things down. This is exactly the kind of game I wanted to play. Um, and so, you know, had a retail publisher been involved with the first Wolfenstein, it would have been toned down. It wouldn't have been as, you know, as dangerous or, you know, as, as edgy as, as it turned out to be. And, you know, we didn't have anyone telling us to tone things down in Duke Nukem 3D or Rise of the Triad, you know. So as independent developers, we were really able to make the exact games we wanted to make. Didn't have to worry about the retail channel because we had the shower channel. It, it, it was doing great for us. And, you know, and this is the same for id, you know, the same for Epic. And like I said, the other, other companies who were out there basically copying this model, it allowed us to, to, to make exactly the games we wanted to make. And I think that's been a big influence. That's incredible. So you don't you don't think like it had an influence on like things like demo discs or like demos that people download, you know, like nowadays, like. Oh, I mean, I think Shareware was kind of like the original demo because I don't yeah. really think there was many companies releasing demos of their game back then. Yeah. Um, I don't really remember that well, but uh, I think that really the demo scene started after the Shareware scene started. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Wow. Thank you for that. Okay. Jaren, um, you have a notable history with Apogee, right? So especially with your work on Prey in 2006, could you discuss your experience with Apogee in the 90s or PC gaming in general? Uh, I mean, well, my experience with Apogee in the 90s was purely as a fan um, uh, and just kind of educating myself and enjoying the product of uh, Apogee um, so much like much like Dave. Yeah, we're only, you know, that three. I'm 84, you're 81. Right? Yeah, uh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, were, we, were chill, we were children, oh, yeah. so. Um, but it definitely shaped my idea of what games could be. Um, it was definitely more on the, you know, there's a, I mean, Apogee al has always had a huge spectrum of, of a variety of titles, uh, whether it be like Monster Bash or, or, or Hocus Pocus or, uh, Wolf 3D, um, and uh, I mean, like today, we I mean, we have a full range. Turbo Overkill is on one end of the spectrum, and then we've got Little Lambs on the whole complete other, and one's super cute, and uh, one's um, something else. <laughs> 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 you got a chainsaw for a leg. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I got off track. <laughs> That's okay. I have ADHD. <laughs> don't we all? Oh, well, I did ask about Prey. Oh, yeah, what about, so what about Prey? <laughs> yeah. I can talk about Prey. Yeah, j tell us a little bit about your experience working on it. Um, that was, that was kind of where, where my career started with 3D Realms. Um, uh, I, was, I was leaving film school, and I saw an opportunity to get involved in uh, uh, helping market the game. Uh, I wasn't really um, super impressed with the, the, uh, the trailers, uh, and, I, and, I, and I had a real passion for kind of visual storytelling at that point. I wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, and so uh, I, I convinced Scott to let me try my hand at making a trailer for Prey. Um, and uh, I spent a, a little money kind of hiring a couple of my buddies uh, who were good at 3D modeling. And these guys were in the kind of more of the CG visual effects end of things. Um, and went out, went out and shot some live footage, uh, did some compositing, uh, kind of used the trailer as an opportunity to kind of tell the story of the game. Um, and that ended up being, we called it the Prey Super Trailer, 
I don't know why I called it that. I think I was just like wanted it to stand out. <laughs> um, and uh, 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 GameTrailers.com ended up rating it at some point, uh, like one of the top 10 trailers of all time. Um, uh, I guess notably it was uh, known as one of like the first video game trailers to incorporate live action footage in uh, its attempt to market the game, mm -hmm. um, rather than just be purely uh, video game footage. Um, uh, at that time, uh, a composer for the game had not been selected. Um, and so uh, I also produced all the soundtracks, um, a lot of the soundtracks that Jeremy Soule was working on, including uh, uh, Morrowind, Elder Scrolls, and Obliv uh, Oblivion, and Skyrim. Um, and we were working on Guild Wars at the time. Uh, and I brought uh, Jeremy on to do the music for the trailer. That was kind of my sneaky way to sort of demo him for the game. Uh, and we ended up bringing him on to do uh, uh, the music for Prey, uh, which was originally spec'd out for like 45 minutes of music for, the, for an eight or nine hour game. Uh, we ended up doing three and a half hours of music for that game, which was absurd for a first person shooter. Um, but I basically spotted the whole game like it was a, like a movie. And uh, I mean, we were referencing like Jerry Goldsmith and like uh, just a bunch of different like film composers that I loved that I felt like uh, the game was trying to tap into that vibe, like Alien and kind of the, the 80s camp. Um, and so, uh, so really tried to like tap into that for the game's music and tell the story and I'm big on that. So, uh, so I got to basically supervise and produce the soundtrack for Prey <coughs> and that led to becoming an audio director and associate producer at 3D Realms. That's really cool. I didn't know Jeremy worked on Prey. Yeah. Yeah. I, I literally have the Morrowind soundtrack playing in my head like all the time, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, okay. Um, David, Atari has a rich legacy in gaming. From your perspective, what were Atari's most significant contributions to PC gaming in the 90s? You know, it's sort of interesting because you're talking about a period during which um, Atari was kind of underneath the water mm. as a brand, um, you know, owned by, by Warner, Hasbro era, picked up by Infogrom. So, you know, a lot of <coughs> what what Atari did in the 90s, you know, was obviously the Jaguar and the 42 games that came <laughs> of that. But otherwise, so much of what's in our portfolio is um, our games by some of those classic 90s brands like Microprose, Spectrum Holobyte, Accolade, um, and a few others. I mean, that's kind of, when I think, oddly enough, when I think of Atari in the 90s as it relates to PC, it's it's that legacy of those smaller studios that have kind of rolled up into what Atari is and what Atari owns and publishes today. Mm. It's, it wasn't really a moment where, where Atari was generating a ton of PC game content. Mm -hmm. um, it was more of a brand that was sort of going through a transition, waiting for its next moment to kind of go back into game creation and publishing. Wow. You know, you mentioned Spectrum Holobyte. Like, I just literally played Star Trek Final Unity literally for the first time, like, a couple of months ago. So you said that, and I was like, oh, okay, I know who they are. There's some, yeah, there's some wild games uh, that have, um, I, you know, and I, I have to deep dive into everything in our portfolio. And God, there's one stunt driver is howling in laughter, you know. A game where you're driving around and if uh, you're competing against a VW bug and if it gets annoys you enough, um, there's an Easter egg where the um, VW engineering team that was being featured in an ad at the time appears in the middle of the race course and you can run them over. <laughs> it's just, I mean, just the 90s, there was just so much going on and so much creativity as people were, try, you know, experimenting with yeah. things. But also there was this era of intense cultural reference coming into games. Yeah. Um, you had so much going on. Like, I mean, yeah, there's just a ton. It, it's, a, it's a fun era to look at. Um, you know, all the hardcore uh, sports sim games, you know, all, everything that EA makes is rooted in the, in the early sports sims of the 90s. I was, I'm a big sports game player as well. It's just, it's, it's sort of a fascinating era to kind of look back at. Yeah, for sure. You And you know, I, I had this written down for later, but I'm gonna ask it now because um, you mentioned Easter eggs, and I wanted to ask all of you, is there an Easter egg that you have placed in a game or worked on that you're like super proud of? Like, I snuck that in there. Uh, 
No? I don't know. I think we've all put dope fish in one game or another. <laughs> I think my favorite is um, in the original Max Payne. Uh, very early in the game, you blow up this door, uh, and all these tiles get scattered on the floor. And it's like, what if those tiles, uh, we snuck in some Tetris pieces? <laughs> and if you, if you, you can, you can look this up on the internet and you can find a, a picture of it, but the tiles are laying on the floor and sure enough, if you look at them carefully, there's a, a, a representative of each of the Tetris pieces on there. So that's a cool, you know, cool. another one that I'm really proud of uh, is, uh, uh, that's one Doom Space Marine uh, from Duke Nukem. Uh, yeah. That one. Uh, Everyone remembers I that I was one. so ready for it to lay a lawsuit on us. Um, <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, we got away with it. Nice. Uh, how many of you guys found, uh, so, like, who played the Plutonium pack for Duke Nukem 3D? Anyone? Probably not. Okay, a couple. Yeah. Like, if you got the Plutonium pack, which was the cool expansion for, D for D official expansion for Duke Nukem 3D, um, you could find the Bridge of the Enterprise D. <gasps> what? Um, which was really cool. Um, and I don't know how these guys did that. I, I guess it just wasn't being policed at the time. It's, it, it's, it's kind of criminal, but it's hilarious. Um, and yep, that, that level's called Warp Factor, I think. Uh. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm always trying to, like, find some way to, like, get some kind of Star Trek reference in our games. Um, how many of y'all played Turbo Overkill? Anyone? Um, a couple? Yeah. <coughs> People from Apogee. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, like, the bad guy is this, like, um, AI that's kind of gone awry, and uh, you're supposed to defeat it with your chainsaw leg. Um, somehow or another. But it manifests itself, and it starts creating ships. Um, and as you work your way through the episodic game, episode three takes you into outer space. Uh, Sam, our, uh, our developer, um, his original design for those spaceships looked kind of like upside down crucifixes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I feel like that's been done somewhere. And like, he's like, oh yeah, it was done in Dune. And I was like, yeah, we can't do that. And so I basically got him to like redesign them to be kind of a variation on like the board cube. Mm. Um, and it's different enough, but it's it like they shoot lasers all over the place, <laughs> but it's it's still pretty cool. So that was my Star Trek reference. I love that. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You look like you're thinking about one. Yeah, I I can't. But we we put a ton in our games, um, but I can't really think of any great ones. All right. Yeah. I don't know, Big John, he's in all of our games. I don't know if he's an Easter egg at this point or if he's expected. <laughs> Y'all. Um, yeah. It's called a cameo. I think. Yeah, it's a cameo yeah. at this point, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got nothing. All right, well, I'll let you think about it for a little while. Okay, so to all my panelists, New Blood, Apogee, Atari Night Dive Studios recently collaborated on remastering Rise of the Triad, Ludicrous Edition. Could you talk about the collaboration process and the title's enduring appeal? Um, well, originally, uh, you know, another company was working on a remaster, and they, uh, you know, they kind of dropped the ball, and uh, Apogee hit me up, and they were like, hey, do you guys want to do the remaster of Rot? And I said, no, <laughs> Night Dive should do the remaster of <laughs> Rot. Good call. Uh, so I hit up Steve Kick, and he was like, yeah, you know, uh, We'd already been working on one, and I was like, cool, this works perfectly. And then uh, we're like, all right, well, let's all get it on it so we can make sure, you know, that everybody's got a little bit of an imprint on it, and let's, you know, let's do a new episode, let's get all the features in there that Night Dive's known for doing in their remasters, and let's, um, let's really come together, because it was a really full circle moment, because, you know, a lot of the guys at New Blood, the first game we ever worked on was the reboot, the 2013 reboot of Rise of the Triad. And what I wanted to do in 2013 was this remaster, but I somehow got talked into a reboot. Um, so it was, it, felt, it was very full circle for me uh, to be working with, you know, uh, with Scott Terry again and the guys at Apogee. Um, and it, you know, be, to be able to bring in, you know, I've been talking to Steve and Larry from Night Dive forever, like, you know, we should do something together one day. So the stars just kind of aligned on Rise of the Triad and, um, it's, uh, it was, yeah, we did it, and it's, it, I, it's the remaster that Rise of the Triad, you know, I speak very fondly of it, it's the one it's always deserved, 
you know, every other shooter from the 90s that got, you know, the night dive treatment, as they say these days, except Rise of the Triad. Uh, so Rot got it, and uh, I couldn't be more proud. Yeah, sometimes things uh, happen at the right moment for a reason. You kind of wonder if you, know, you wanted to do something at a certain time, but, but the, the engine or the emulation or the team that you could pull together to make it happen wouldn't have been right, right? And, and you, yeah, you, you look at that title, and if you know Steven, you're like, yeah. yeah. Right, this is just, this is just the, perfect, the perfect match, the perfect moment. Um, love it when that happens. Yeah, okay. Well, um, what do you think were the most defining characteristics of 90s PC gaming that should still be embraced by game developers today? Sure. I will say good level design. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's a, it's a good question. And one of the things that Dave was talking about before that I love about the era, but also the way that, that, that you guys comp you know, compose your titles is that um, you're pulling all these great moments from the, from the games in the 90s. And I kind of liked how um, some of the games would change pace and change things on you and catch you by surprise in a way that was just joyful. Um, different from now where you know, often developers are trying to shock you um, as opposed to just sort of knock you off your balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love that little moment of surprise, that little moment that knocks you off your balance where you're, you think you're playing a first person shooter but suddenly you're not and then you are again and yeah. it makes sense. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of just, I don't know, what would you call it, technique? Uh, um, about how, how those games were, were thought of and conceived um, that just, you know, I love to see it come back. I love to see it come back in games now. I love it when uh, modern cartoons reference the games in the 90s. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that um, because there's, you know, we're all speaking this language, right? It's almost like a secret language. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. You know, one of the things I, I, uh, I've noticed and I say a lot is that great art is often uh, born from limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and back in the 90s, you guys were very limited with the technology and the things you could do, so you had to make the most of it. You had to be effective in the way you communicated things to the player without having unlimited budget, unlimited visuals, and unlimited everything that some kind, sometimes just creates a mess. Um, so because of the limitations, and if you can go back to thinking, having that kind of mindset, what if we only had these tools? What if we only use this sort of color palette? What if we only have this sort of design? And design around that, you often come up with something much more engaging than if you just have infinite resources. Um, so I think a lot of what happened in the 90s was born from those limitations, and that's why, you know, I was talking about this on a documentary the other day about horror games. You know, they can only do so much with the PS1 and the PS2, but that's how you ended up with games like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. You know, with, uh, what they ended up doing with the stuff like The Fog and all that stuff because they had to, but that's how they created effective horror because of the limitations they had. In the same way, you know, uh, you know John, the things Carmack was able to do with lighting every time, you know, he made a new engine, um, these limitations often enforced the design. You know, and I was talking about, I don't know if you guys remember the PS1 port of Doom. I know this is a PC gaming thing, but that it was a horror game because of what John and Aubrey were able to do. You know, the soundtrack was completely different. The lighting was completely different. It, that wasn't the Doom of PC. That was a horror game. Uh, and it was awesome because of it. But it was because you guys were experimenting with so much technology and stuff back then that it was completely different. And um, I miss that. And I think, yeah. you know, we can, we can return. We yeah. can bring that back. You just have to get yourself in the mindset of the people who are working within their limitations. Yeah. Yeah, in the, in the 90s, Interplay had a good slogan I always liked, uh, by gamers, uh, for gamers, for yeah. gamers. Yeah. And that was the mindset of really every studio I knew back then. Uh, you know, we were all hardcore gamers. Internally, when we were working on games, most of our discussion was about gameplay, it wasn't about marketing or technology really, even though technology was important to us. It was always about, is this gonna be fun? What, how can we make this fun? If it's not fun, let's cut it out. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, it was it was it just seemed like a more authentic era, uh, really focused on gameplay back in the nineties. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Jared? Uh, I was just kind of kind of put a focus on authenticity, um, yeah. and you know, uh, I, I what Dave said really resonated with me in terms of like uh, 
having to, you know, be really creative with uh, and and ingenuitive with like your your limitations, working within those, and and how that kind of gave birth to a lot of the the really interesting and fun and memorable moments in games from the 90s um, and left a lot of things to the imagination which just a lot of things aren't left to the imagination yeah anymore. i mean just in like rise of the triad like the way the gads came about because you couldn't do room over room in the wolf engine so todd came up todd came up with the idea of these little floating platforms that you could use to get to places and it's become one of the most iconic things you know, be, be working because the engine just couldn't do things. You still had 90 degree walls and stuff like that, but they managed to make such fun levels, you know, even with the limitations. Um, it was, yeah, and it's creativity. I mean, the, the, the trick nowadays, uh, I mean, in terms of like the guys that um, we work with at Apogee, and I'm sure same with Dave, um, is, uh, you know, these are smaller teams. And so they're, they're just limited by manpower. Yeah. But the tools are so good now, it, it, it kind of balances out. But still, only one man, you know, is only capable of so much thought. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, we when just we... just clone David Szymanski. <laughs> <laughs> he makes so many games. Or Sam Preble. Or Sam, yeah. Um, and uh, really, it's, it's about kind of coming in and just, like, allowing those guys to still, you know, stay the course and do what they want to do and allow them to make the game that they want to make but uh, support them and, and enhance it where necessary, but don't derail it um, or make it bigger than it needs to be. Um, stay true to the vision and be authentic. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. certainly back. Hey, you could do that in the nine. The teams were smaller. I was reading an article today. Uh, the, you know, the quest designer on Starfield gave a GDC talk and he's like, when we did, when we did Skyrim, it was 100 people. When we did Fallout 4, it was 150 people. By the time we got to Starfield, it was 500 people, and I didn't know half the people and half the departments we were working with. Wow. And then he quit. <laughs> wow. And wow. I was like, yeah, that'll happen. Got to yeah. keep it, keep the family, keep it small. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of noticing a trend, and I don't know if you all are noticing it too, but maybe in, like, indie games nowadays, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of games that look like, have a retro look, a low poly feel, a pixel feel. Are you all noticing that too? The vibes. Yeah. yeah. I um, feel like everybody's drawing like inspiration from like 90s yeah. kind of vibes. Everything goes in cycles. You know, people are trying to, you know, bring back their childhood. Everybody loves nostalgia. Um, plus a lot of that stuff just looks good. It's timeless. Yeah. Uh, you know, great, uh, great art design is timeless. Great game design is timeless. Um, so people love that stuff, you know, like the, the 2D, 3D look, you know, like the Octopath Traveler look, everybody's doing that now because it just looks so cool. Um, you know, and a lot of stuff with, you know, our games, you know, um, you know, high res textures over low poly models, it's just, it's a cool look because you can get really crisp stuff, but it still looks retro. It's like, it's a, it's a fun way to do things. Yeah. You know, it's, it invokes a feeling, you know, uh, it's, and we have to, these engines, we have to, <laughs> Unity and Unreal, we have to beat them into submission to make the games look old because they're constantly <laughs> trying to make the games look better. We're like, no, Unity, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, again, it's fun. It's like working within limitations. It's trying to do something that, you know, not everybody's trying to do. We're specifically trying to make the games look old or worse, as some people would say, but it's because we miss the way things looked back then because the 90s were better, and that's why everybody <laughs> came to this talk. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, I've got a question for Scott and Dave. Um, considering your significant roles in gaming history and current trends, what future innovations do you hope to see inspired by the 90s era? AI should be making everything. <laughs> <laughs> Skynet's coming for you. <laughs> what, what, uh, I mean, I, I I've always, you know, I've been saying for several years now, I think physics is, is going to be a big player in the future. Uh, I think it's going to open up a lot of gameplay. You know, we see this kind of thing now, like with, uh, with Teardown, you know, Voxel Engine. I think it's just going to be a big player in the future, uh, physics-based gameplay. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's all I got, Dave. Uh, what was the question? Because <laughs> it was like one for him and one for me, right? Um, considering your significant roles in gaming history and current trends, mm -hmm. what future innovation do you hope to see inspired mm -hmm. by the 90s era? Future innovations inspired by the 90s. Um, really edgy magazine ads. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those? Remember game ads in the 90s? They, they had they 
box art that looked nothing like the game. Yeah, oh my God, oh, yeah. That was the best. Well, we do that a lot with our, with our box that art. That goes back to the 70s. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's not uh, 90 specific. I have yeah. the art of Atari bug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I it's, have it. <laughs> simpler time, better time. Um, yeah, no, not actually. I don't mean that. We don't need to have edgy magazine ads again. Or maybe we do. PlayStation used to have really crazy ones, remember? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, innovations from the 90s. Can I say good level design again? <laughs> sure, okay. it's valid. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I think we all, we are, we are, you know, coming back because, you know, uh, a lot of what we do now are these, you know, especially my company is retro shooters. And all that design has come from, you know, these are brand new games that are designed like games from the 90s. So yeah. we have done that. We have taken, you know, and innovated because now it's innovating. Yeah. Because a lot of people who've played our games have never played games like this. Yeah. They're younger. Like, I feel like young, but actually, like, the people that play our games, you know, like, in their teens and their 20s, and I'm 20 years older than them. And they never played the original Doom and Quake and stuff like that. So this type of stuff is fresh to them. And I feel ancient. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I did only play Doom like maybe two years ago yeah. for the first time ever. But it was because when I was growing up, it was scary to me. Yeah. So in doing this and bringing this stuff back, we are somehow now innovating again. But I think it's more, to me, it's more about, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, preservation. We're preserving yeah. these ideas for future generations uh, because they can and will be lost if we don't preserve them. Um, video game preservation is very important. And there are a bunch of charities you can donate to that make that happen. Or you can just, you know, keep your games and not give them away. You know, that kind oh. of thing. My, I, I didn't know my big box PC games were going to be worth so much money. I, so, like, I would, I would take the, you know those big CD folders that we had yeah. in the 90s and stuff? So, like, I thought that was the way to keep your game. So, I, my copy of Deus Ex, Half-Life, I'd take, throw the boxes out and just no. put them in to sleep. I thought that... Not Deus Ex. Yeah. <laughs> they took up too much damn room. Yeah, yeah they did. And they like, we didn't know they were going to be, we didn't know they'd be collectible yeah. 20 yeah. years later. That was just like, it was a box. Yeah. Uh, and now I hate myself. <laughs> I know. And I still have all the, I still have like the big flip of all the mm. CDs and I'll go through. And I was like, I had the boxes yeah. for all of these. Cool. Oh, the orange box threw that out. Sick. Oh, dear. Oh, um, gosh. You know. Anyway, now I'm, I'm sad. I got lucky and my mom kept all the boxes yeah. in storage. Nice. Oh, my parents threw out my Legos. <laughs> <laughs> that was messed up, man. I, I got trauma. <laughs> How long you guys got? Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> you think about, though, the, 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 you know, the kids who grew up in these sandbox environments with, with no constraints, and you put them through a really good level. Yeah. It's not necessarily retro to them. It's new to them, the fact that you're sort of gating and channeling them through a specific experience. Yeah. To them, it's kind of exhilarating because they've been running around in the desert taking 20 minutes to get from point A to point yeah. B <laughs> in a big sandbox game. And I think that's a lot of it, too. It's just, um, uh, you know, uh, the nostalgia we have from the 90s was discovering some of these sort of things for the first time. And, you know, successive generations get to discover it again, too, if we keep republishing and remastering the games and bringing them back because um, it's a new experience for them, you know, yeah. keeping it going. Yeah. You know, I often tell people when I'm streaming, like, I played these games with my dad, you know, like, I played these games together, like, you know, all the Atari, Amiga, like, PC games and stuff like that, but then there are a lot of people who never heard of it, and then they're, like, a, loving the story of the fact that I used to play these games with my family, but then B, also, like, they're getting to experience it the first time, and then they're going and playing it, you know? So it is a way of preservation. It's really nice. Yeah, and it's important. I think, you know, that's why what Night Dive does is so important, because a lot of these games, like, you could st they still exist, but you can't play them on modern systems. Yeah. So being able to re-release. Um, and even, you know, what GOG did yesterday, Alpha Protocol, they yeah. re-released it exclusively on GOG, and I loved Alpha Protocol. It was so overlooked in 2011. I loved that game yeah. from Obsidian. And it's just like, but it wasn't playable. It wasn't on any stores. And GOG went out and got the rights from Sega and Obsidian, and they, it's not a remaster, but like they got it running again and working without any of the licensing issues. All the licensed music's in there. It's like, that's sick. Yeah. Because if, if there's a game that you like and you remember, you should be able to go buy it and play, play it, it legally with no issues. 
Um, so oh, that please say it louder for the people yeah. in the back, for real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's true. like, let me give you money. And if not, whatever, I'm going to pirate it. But, like, we shouldn't have to. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't have to get viruses on my computer because I want to play an old game. Yeah. Um, thank so you, Gog, and yeah, DRM3. Yes, uh, thank you, Gog, and thank you, Night Dive, for doing what you do. And thank you, mostly Kaiser. We're going to give him a shout out, you know, the main programmer over at Night Dive. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You know, I think this moment of... Um, where, where remasters and lots of retro collections are doing well. I mean, our hope at Atari is that it's going to encourage more IP holders who have been sitting on the sidelines yep. to either, yep. you know, for heaven's sake, you know, get it back out there or let somebody else do it, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's got to be a big part of the, this conversation around preservation going forward is, you know, as long as, as long as this is a successful part of the business, and it is, yeah. you know, um, we'll see more. Right? Yeah. So yeah, and it's always fun when a new one pops up. It's like no way. Like when you guys announced uh, Dark Forces. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's like no, Disney let them do that. Like, yeah. Oh, you know, and I know why because you know my buddy John Drake over there is pushing for stuff like that. But it's like, who would have thought? Yeah. That the mouse would let them touch Star Wars in the year of our Lord 2020. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's to trust is you too. If you can do the first one well, yeah. and then it's like, okay, well, there's a couple of there's a couple other games we'd like you to do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and that you know comes back to doing it right. Yeah. You know? And it helps because because you can tell when you play a, a, a good remaster of a game from the '90s that the folks behind it. Yeah. Uh, you know, cared. They and the console a, stuff's happening too. Like we just got the Tomb Raider Tomb collection. I was just oh, gonna yeah. say yeah. that was really That's good. Uh, yeah, it's uh, we are in a golden age of not only you know retro styled games, but you know retro remasters. Like yeah. it's it's good to be a '90s kid again. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm also a big fan of the mini consoles, like the Atari yeah. 400 that's in the booth there today. Like yeah. big fan of that stuff. Yeah, the little they they mostly sit on my shelves as like collectibles, but like they are cool when you when you boot them up. Yeah, and you, yeah, and you could uh, you could splash them, and you know, you know like mm. there's raspberry Pi in there, and <laughs> a bunch of very legal ROMs on them. It's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and to the next question, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, Jaron, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, because you mentioned earlier, you know, working with Jeremy Soul and all the music stuff for Prey and doing the Zelda symphony and all that kind of stuff. Like, do you have like, well, I guess I could ask all of you this. Like, do you have like favorite video game soundtracks from anything that you worked on or just in general? Rise of the Triad. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to keep saying that. Yeah. Favorite video game soundtrack, video game um, music. I mean, I, uh, fortunately I get to kind of be involved in all the soundtrack production for all of our games at Apogee. Um, and, and that kind of dates back to Prey. Um, but, uh, I mean, I have, uh, I, mean, I have a lot of memories in terms of video game music. Um, uh, I mean, one of my favorites, of course, that I didn't, I mean, I worked on it through my producing history with Nintendo, but, um, you know, The Legend of Zelda. Uh, and getting to sit down, I mean, I'll never forget uh, being uh, at the premiere of the 25th anniversary symphony, and I had Iji Onuma on my left side sitting next to me, and Koji Kondo on my right side, like pointing at my laptop as I was like tweaking an edit that was accompanying a game that one produ pr produced and directed to music that the other one wrote. And they were both laughing and like being joyful about the thing that I had like created to represent their work. Wow. And that's, that's, I mean, it's not quite what you're asking, but like, that's a very joy. But it's, it's such, it's a really amazing moment. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know, I was 27, yeah. 28. Um, so very surreal. I don't know if it'll, it'll ever top that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, that and, uh, yeah, working, working with Jeremy on Prey was awesome. Um, getting to do something different with him. I don't think he's ever done a sci-fi score like that before. Um, and it's, cool, you know, now hearing people saying that they, you know, you, the internet did not, it was not as pervasive and did not exist even then in 2007 as it does now. And so you don't know who's listening to this stuff. You don't know who's hearing it, who's appreciating it in the game. Yeah. And like more and more, I keep hearing people like say, yeah, I really love that. Like, mm -hmm. and that's rewarding, um, especially like I mean, we're coming, it's not too far, like, it's over 20 years after the fact. Yeah. Sucks. 
<laughs> we were anxious. We're old, man. <laughs> Don't get old, kids. Scott, do you have any uh, favorite video game soundtracks? I mean, I, I remember when we had uh, found this uh, musician. His name was Bobby Prince. He was an attorney, and I found him on Prodigy talking about he's, he's also a musician. And, uh, and I was like, Bobby, you know, we, we got some games uh, maybe you can help us with. And I got him connected to id Software, and he did some work with Commander Keen. And it was all very cutesy music and everything. And then when it came time to do Wolfenstein, uh, he was asked to do the music for that. And I'm like, man, you know, he's done this cute Keen game music and can you pull off Wolfenstein? And I was just amazed at what he came up with, you know, hearing these songs coming through and it just matched the, the vibe of the game perfectly. And to me, that was just a, such a magical moment. And I realized, wow, musicians can do more than just one type of music, you know, they, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, and uh, so just, just hearing the soundtrack to Wolfenstein come together, I can still hear so many of the songs in my head having played the game a million times during the testing phase and so on. It, it's just, it was just a remarkable experience to me. I mean, I've had so many great memories, you know, even with like the Duke Nukem music, Rise of the Triad, the Shadow Warrior music, just all of our games have amazing music. Uh, even, you know, Max Payne 1, that yeah. sort of sorrowful opening theme song at the title screen, that, that gets to me every time I hear it. Um, so yeah, I've I just been lucky to, to, to have worked with so many awesome musicians, but yeah, Wolfstein really stands out to me. Love it. I love it. Well, we are coming up on like 10 minutes, nine minutes left. Do you want to take some questions from the audience? Yeah. Does anybody in the audience have any questions? Yeah, should we just uh, have them form a line and do the microphone thing? What do we? Yeah. Do, uh, do we have one for them? Yes, we, yes, got we a hot do. Mic, hot mic, hot mic. Hot mic. Oh, yeah. He's got a mic. I saw a question over here somewhere. You're not allowed to leave. No, it's just not yeah. Yeah. Got to stay for the Q&A. Hello, is this thing on? Oh my yes. God, it is. Well, thank you all so much. This panel was amazing. I really appreciate it. Great first day of PAX. My question is kind of for Scott in particular. I've been reading uh, John Romero's autobiography, Doom Guy, and in it he talks about uh, the reason that they didn't do Doom through Apogee was because of the like sales channel was messed up. And I would really love to hear your side of like what happened, why it didn't get resolved, and why they went you know, self-published. Uh, boy, you're really diving into a deep, deep topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was even recently in Ireland. I met with John and his wife, Brenda, and we kind of talked about this. Basically, some facts were a little off. Uh, some, some of the stuff that he got was through, we had, a, we had an employee who ran our, our sales channel at the time that uh, we later found out was very much into a lot of drugs. And uh, so... <laughs> And he, and he wanted to work with Id. He told Id a bunch of stuff that wasn't really true. And um, it just, so that's the one part of the book that I would say doesn't quite get things right. I think that the, the book is awesome otherwise. Um, it's a good book. You should read it. Everyone yeah, should buy book, it. Uh, yeah. uh, On my list. Yeah, it's a good so, book. So, yeah. Don't do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, how's it going? Uh, so you guys kind of touched on this earlier, but I've been thinking the whole day walking around the show floor and just the past few years with games. So the first open world game I ever played was like Oblivion. And I remember starting it up and I'm like, I have no idea what to do. No one's telling me what to do. But now everything's open world, it seems. Um, and I do kind of miss linear games. Uh, so what are your thoughts on like linear single player games? I that think kind of linear games can be great, you know, we, just because, you know, I might personally prefer stuff with, you know, a bit more, you know, involved level design. Uh, like, I love a good, you know, you know, Half-Life is pretty much a linear game. Uh, you know, you know, games that tell a story, you know, uh, Raven, I think, made some of the best of those, you know, even, you know, when they were still making their own games, now they're stuck in the Call of Duty mines. Uh, but, like, when they were still doing stuff, like, I even like Quake 4, Singularity, games like that, which are pretty linear, but they tell you a good story. Um, so I think, I th I'm, I'm a fan of linear as long as it serves the story, even though I tend to prefer, you know, deeper, funner level design. But uh, linear can be good, too. Everything needs a good train level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that you brought up Oblivion, too, because I'm playing that right now for the first time ever. So, yes, yeah. Thieves Guild, awesome. Uh, 
thanks very much. This is great. Uh, the 90s were better. I want to go back. That's right. Um, yes. So thanks for taking me back. Um, this is all kind of mixed up in my head, but one of the things you guys are making me think about a lot in your comments is that something people say a lot now is that it's hard to be funny in games mm. and that comedy is really difficult. And mm. hearing you guys talk about the games from the 90s, I realized they were all funny. There was no problem with them being funny. Oh. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've kind of noticed about that is that they were also very sincere. Like Duke Nukem was 100% serious about himself and it was stupid all the time. Oh. So like the funny thing was that contrast, but he was very sincere. And like Dusk is super grim, but I don't want to spoil it, but there's a bar of soap yeah. in like every level. Like, yeah. So like that combination seems like it's definitely possible, but some people seem to think some people seem to think basically that sincerity and cringe are the same thing too. Yeah. They don't seem mm. to understand well sincerity. The, the, so the, the devil's in the in the details, you know, the fact that mm -hmm. back then or even now when we're independent, we can focus on the fun stuff that we want to put in the game. Like the soap and dusk was an accident. And we just thought it was so funny that David accidentally set when you throw the soap to damage to be nine 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 nine. <laughs> and it and it can kill anything in the game. And it became, we're like, no, we're keeping that. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, and that's the kind of thing that like you could do when you're independent, you know. Or you know, I, I can't speak to Duke specifically, but Duke was, you know, Duke took himself very seriously, you know. Uh, but it was funny because the delivery that John had was just awesome, and it was just like hell yeah, this this is like every '80s action movie ever. Um, but it was it was delivered straightforward, and that's what made it great. You know, we we cared about the details, um, at least the, you know, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, it was like that too. I think blood. Oh yeah. Blood was very. It's like dark, but. You look in the mirror and he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, Stefan's delivery there. And he doesn't even remember doing blood because I talked to him a lot because he's been in all of our games now, Stefan Waite, um, since we had him in Dusk. And uh, it's, yeah, his it just uh, voice acting makes a big difference. Oh, yeah. And it's such a, like, the bullshit now with AI voice acting. It's like you can't, re you could never replicate Duke Nukem. You could never replicate Caleb and blood. I dare you, you fucking computers. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the, there's a, there's a long, dark pause where people just stopped using voiceover at all, and it's one of my favorite parts of the game, yeah. uh, of many games, is just, is the voice talent and what they do. It, it is, uh, it's magical, and I, and I, I found that we had this explosion of indie games where I understand the budgets were lower, right. um, and I think, oh, I love this game, but nobody's saying anything. So well, now we've got Gianni, and he could just be in every game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So He's signing at the Dublin booth every day from 3 to 6. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Uh, not to hit you with the hardest question, probably, of all of these. Uh, uh -oh. That uh -oh. whoosh, 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 saw, uh, uh, sound that the spikes made from uh, Rise of the Triad, the ones that came I up on exactly the ground. I know exactly the sound you're making. Was that, you was that, that was really good. That was yeah, acapella, right? Whoosh, yeah, that was good. I know was exactly that, was, was that done acapella? Like, was that just somebody in a microphone just making, like, the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh thing? Yes. Yes? yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, if any of you worked on Skyroads, Skyroads was awesome. <laughs> Okay, I guess we actually know. We have time oh, for okay, one more. Yeah, we do have time for one more. One more, maybe right two here. more. Pause. Yeah, we should have done a cue. I don't know what's going on here. Oh, right here. Yeah. Oh. So uh, you guys are talking a lot about going back and remastering old games. Um, I believe it was Apache who did Star Gunner a long time ago. It was a side-scrolling shooter. You guys yep. ever think about taking something like that and bring it forward maybe into like a flight sim or pushing it into a more modern genre? Well, you're really asking for a big big budget game now. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, we've thought about remastering it. It is on our list. Uh, we're going to try and do Raptor first. Uh, but, uh, mm. yeah. Right there. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned King's Quest. Uh, my favorite games, uh, due to my age in the 90s, perhaps, but I'm wondering if they hold up are were the Sierra games. Um, and as far as humor, like Space Quest. Um, Gabriel Knight. Yeah. 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 Leisure Suit Larry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Why does everybody laugh when I say Leisure <laughs> Suit Larry? So I love yeah. those games. My question is, is it, um, are, are there, have you heard whispers of Sierra IP becoming more available for re-release or is it 
because it's owned by Blizzard yeah. or they're Activision. Like, yeah. What's uh, the What's the tea? I wish. I mean, I've actually been reading the. Uh, there's a. You know, I just read um, Ken Williams' uh, biography, and I'm currently reading the Sierra Adventure, which is a great uh, book about the history of Sierra. Um, and uh, I know um, Roberta has recently been active in game development again. She's been they doing new versions of her. Uh, some of her original games, one in VR and one flat screen. Uh, so her and Ken are like dabbling again. Uh, as far as the old IPs, I know there have been some, you know, there have been some Kickstarter like, you know, um, spiritual successors. Um, I know they, the Space Quest guys did a new game that I think finally actually came out after 10 years after its Kickstarter because I got an email about it. Um, as far as the original IPs, I think there was something with the King's Quest. I I would love it, but as far as if I had heard any rumblings, we can only hope. But listen, Disney let Night Dive remaster a Star Wars <laughs> game. Anything is possible. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Well, with that, thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the panelists for all of your expertise. Eat Have a great pack. <laughs> we appreciate you all coming in. Your toast. Kyle. Eat lead.